You need people who understand how to maintain justice. What about education? That's another one. Education. Our founders, again, many would argue, is sort of depended on a fairly knowledgeable and informed populace because that became the foundation of democracy. And what you want is a democracy and not an idiocracy, right? And so the ministry is one of the classic professions as well. Because you need people to care for the souls of men and women. The last of these big five is what many of you have chosen to do. That is the profession of arms. And so a profession is something that is dedicated to the existence of society. Now, it, it doesn't mean that uh, there aren't other good industries, right? What it does mean is that society has to determine that your profession is so uh, broad and so related to combating existen existential threats to society that they decide what's a society. So, professionalism. Another one of those words that sometimes is uh, overused but underdefined. And so sometimes, uh, you know, you know if, you're, if you're talking to a telemarketer on, on the phone, um, and that person is rude to you, you might say that person lacks professionalism. Or, or maybe in a, in a formal type of office, if somebody wears jeans to work, you might say what you wear lacks professionalism. In so doing, what we're saying, that, you know, th that, that just might diminish the word. Professionalism is you doing the best you can, being the best possible person you can in your profession. Because if you don't do what you do very, very well, society might be at risk. That's a pretty big deal. So just imagine, let's take two possible examples here. Let's take cardiology and cosmetology. Well, cardiology requires a, you know, a bunch of education and, and a licensure and an outside group which, uh, which makes sure that standards are maintained. Well, you say, well, so does cosmetology. That's a lot of training. I certainly don't know how to do it. You know who my barber is when I go to the barber shop? It's the same person every time, and they yell out their name, I think. Next. That's my barber. Well, if I go to a cosmetologist and they do a bad job, I'll be back in two weeks. My hair's going to grow back. I'm no worse for the wear. I have a slightly different opinion when I go to a cardiologist. I say, we only got one chance here, pal. I got one heart, and I hope you don't mess it up. What we're talking about here, professionalism, is you being the best possible you so that you can do your job on behalf of society. That's professionalism. Now, does that mean that the only valuable people in our society are those who are in one of these professions? Absolutely not. As a, as a theologian, Everybody has equal worth and dignity in the eyes of God. And it does not matter what you do. As Reverend King has said here, if you're a street sweeper, you know you answer to a higher authority than your boss. That's a different conversation, though, than whether or not you are in a profession. Because remember, society determines what is considered a profession. The key here is trust, right? The key is trust. So here's an example. When I walk into a doctor's office, I'm a little bit scared for all sorts of reasons. And uh, as some of you may know, the older you get, the more trips you make to the doctor's office. So I walk into the doctor's office. This person I've never met before comes in, 
ha they have a white coat on, and immediately I say, I trust you. I don't know one thing about this person. I don't know where they went to school. I don't, they might be an actor, you know, as far as I know, but, but I trust them. You know, they're wearing the old stethoscope, they're wearing the white coat. Here they are, and here I am. It reminds me sometimes of that, that George Carlin quote. Now, I don't recommend you listen to George Carlin, so if you've never heard of him, don't go looking on YouTube, all right? He doesn't always use Sunday school words, is all I'm saying. <laughs> but, but, but George Carlin said this one time. He said, think about how stupid the average American is. And then think about the fact that half the population is stupider than that. <laughs> so I go into a doctor's office. Sometimes what comes to my mind is, as somebody told me once, you know that 50% of all doctors graduated in the bottom half of their class but I knew nothing about this doctor. But because I trust society, I trust the system, I, I, I trust the fact that they are in a profession, um, I, I, I trust them almost implicitly. Professional is another word that can be a little bit confusing. And so here's where it goes, a, a professional baseball player. Really? What we say there, professional baseball player, all we're really saying is, here's somebody who is so good that they get paid for it. So professional as opposed to amateur. That can confuse the issue here. Because a professional is somebody who is in a profession which promotes the public good. And that's what we're talking about. And here's the big deal, the profession of arms. Notice here that uh, if you are wearing a uniform or if you are a civilian airman to some extent, you understand that your job is to help manage the justified lethal application of force. That's a big deal. That's why this is something we have to pay pretty close attention to. That's why if the word is overused and underdefined, it diminishes its impact. And it diminishes how we think about it, which is why it is, it is great that this whole NCLS, the theme is the prof professional, professionalism and the profession of arms. Because what we do, the stakes are so high that our standards, have to be all the more higher. Professionalism is uh, an inside job. It's something that comes from the inside out, not vice versa. It's an outward expression of an inward experience, which is what MacArthur's quote says here. MacArthur says that if you're in the profession of arms, your job is to win wars on behalf of society. That's your job. But it's based on what's inside of you. Your commitment to three words, he would say, duty, honor, and country. It's an inside job first. Now, just a word of caution here. If you're a cadet, you're blessed because you don't have to be fully committed to this yet. That's what this experience is all about. We want you to be thinking about the hard things that you may have to do or may ask other people to do as a leader in the profession of arms because the profession of arms is the justified application of lethal violence, decided, by the way, by somebody above you, some competent authority, our government. But it starts on the inside. When I look out of my office at the Pentagon, and you know, there are two things you don't want to brag about at the Pentagon. Uh, the, the first is whether or not you have a parking space. 
because there's 25,000 parking places at the Pentagon. Oh, I'm sorry, 25,000 people who work at the Pentagon and only 3,000 parking places. So people do all sorts of stuff to get to work. Ride with strangers, you know, get on buses, get on metros, walk through the rain, walk through the snow. And so if you happen to tell them, oh, yeah, I parked in my parking, car, parking place and it's such a long walk, they don't have much sympathy for you. The other thing you don't want to tell people about your office in the Pentagon is whether or not you have a window. Well, I have a window. Uh, now, my window isn't on the best side of the Pentagon. So when I stand up at, at my desk I and mean, look out my little window, what I see is Macy's. I look across the parking lot to the Pentagon City Mall where Macy's is. Well, that's not that good of a deal. Um, I don't like Macy's because Macy's costs money. My wife enjoys Macy's. But if I look to the right, what I see is the Air Force Memorial. And those three awesome, amazing spires. If you've ever been to the Air Force Memorial, and, and if you haven't, I recommend you do, um, there, there, there's a couple of displays, but there's some quotes that are etched into granite walls and, and some glass of some variety. This is one of those quotes. General Fogelman says, why do we have to be the best at what we do? Because the security of our nation is at stake. High stakes leads to high standards. Here's some other quotes that are etched in. Notice in every one of these, the central issue is trust. Your personal integrity has an impact on the trust that the nation has for your profession. Service before self is based on something bigger than you are. You see, if you understand that you are in a profession where you, your responsibilities help so many other people and the existence of society, then it is, it is a lot easier to have service before self in that context. But what about excellence in all we do? When lives depend on you doing your job well, there is no such thing as good enough for government work. I love what that pace video says about the core values because it makes it real. The video says that integrity does not mean sainthood. Excellence does not mean perfection. And selflessness does not mean that you don't matter. That's why I have always loved service before self because the institution acknowledges that you are important. Selflessness does not mean thinking less of yourself. It means thinking of yourself less. That's what this is about. I took the little blue book about the F of arms and I went through it myself. And I took out all extraneous words, you know, all the A's, the V's, the A's, and all that. I did this myself. Um, and then I, I, I wound down to about 75 words left. And I, and I put that little blue book into a word cloud generator. And I pushed the, word, uh, pushed the button that said generate. And this is what came out. We could spend this whole symposium talking about this one slide. Because this is what our profession is all about. Look at any of those words and understand that our job collectively is to be good at all of those. It's a higher calling. Look at integrity, duty, loyalty, commitment, passion, patriots, character, teamwork, core values, profession of arms, constitution, all of that. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is who we are. This is what we do. 
Here's the bottom line for us. Your personal character determines your professional competence, which then determines organizational effectiveness. Everything rises and falls on your personal, individual character. Because that determines if, whether or not you're going to do things with excellence and serve other people. And whether or not you're going to be satisfied for being just mediocre at your job or really, really good at it. That's what this is all about. Personal character precedes professional competence, which then precedes organizational effectiveness. Now, character is an interesting word. And uh, would you care to guess what the Greek word for character is? It's character. Every place you see a C in character, just put a K, and you got character. You know what the Greek word for character is? It's an imprint, an engraving marker. And in this context, it's an engraving marker that puts an imprint on your soul. It is who you are. In this context, professional, personal character is who you are. Professional competence is how you do the job that you do. And organizational effectiveness is what's done. Remember Simon Sinek's golden circle? That says, start with why. I would say this is a parallel to that. We start with who in this case? Who are you? What is your integrity like? What is your commitment to service before self like? What, what is your commitment to excellence like? What, what is it? That's who you are. That determines then how you do it, per professional competence. Now, here's the deal. You can fake, if you wish, you can fake professional competence. You can be a really good pilot, as an example, who is really good at flying jets in a peacetime context. But if you haven't thought about character and morals and ethics and all of that, you're professional competence, you, you, you're, how good you are in the cockpit may not translate into you making those decisions in a combat setting. Here's another thing. What do people think about when they think about you? Because that is your personal imprint. That's your character. What do they think about when they think about you? If you're a person who is really, really, really good at what you do, but you treat people poorly, and everybody in your unit knows that you're all about yourself, even if the commander hadn't figured it out yet, you know what they're worried about? They're not worried about your competence. They're worried about your character. Because what, they, what they're concerned about is, hey, if we get into a combat situation, um, and, and it, the guy has to choose between himself uh, and me, who's he going to pick? A person of character is probably going to pick you. A person without it, you don't know. That's why personal character leads to professional competence, then which leads to organizational effectiveness. You, you've probably never heard of a, a, a Scottish fellow named Dominic Curry. But Dominic Curry uh, was the product of a, a fairly dashing Russian soldier, apparently, in the 1950s, uh, and uh, a, a Scottish woman, this Dominic's mother. Well, they had a relationship that didn't last all that long, but Dominic was the product of it. Well, the Russian soldier, as he goes back home, um, he, he, he goes away for a day or two, and he comes back, and he gives Dominic's mother, Annette, this painting. She had no idea what it was, but what he said was something kind of curious. He said, listen, if you get into financial trouble, this thing will help you out. She looked at the painting, and she said, I don't know how, this is going to help me out. So she put it in the attic. 1953. In the year 2000, Annette died. Well, Dominic was so broken up by the fact that, that his mom had died that he didn't even want to go into the attic and look at her stuff. Well, in 2015, back in June, he decided to go up there. He's an artist, and he went through his stuff, and he found this, this painting. 
and it was wrapped in Russian newspapers dated 1953. And he, he, he wiped it off and he held it up. He looked at it. He looked at the bottom. And there was one word at the bottom. The one word was Picasso. They tell Dominic Curry, according to the UK Daily Mail from June of 2015 anyway, they tell him that this thing is probably worth 115 million pounds. Now just think about this. This thing had been in the attic all those years and could have been spent in many, any number of different ways. But nobody went up to the attic to think about it. It was only when they got up there and dusted it off and thought about it that they, that they knew what they had. That's what we're doing here. Because the profession of arms is the Picasso. So we take it out. We dust it off. We, we look at it. We, we see how valuable it is. And so when you think about your own personal character, that's where you start. Because people are counting on you. Personal character probably is best described, in my opinion, um, in, the, in the comprehensive airman fitness uh, deal that the Air Force has got going, right? Four pillars. It's physical. It's mental. It's social. And it's spiritual. Now, physical is fairly obvious, right? Mental is somewhat obvious. You do that in education. You do that by reading books. You, you, you listen to lectures, etc. Social is you being around people who are like-minded. But what about spiritual? Where does the spiritual fit into this thing? And I think what has happened in the last decade or so, I think that we've gotten a, a little bit afraid of spirituality. I think that we've gotten so afraid of it that we've kind of put it in the junk drawer a little bit. And it's one of those words that we don't talk about much because we're scared of it. I would just say to you that spirituality is part of comprehensive airman fitness, not because the chaplains needed something to do, but because the research in many, many ways speaks to the value of spirituality and faith on not just who you are, but also what you do. There are all sorts of spiritualities, right? There's Buddhist spirituality, there's, there's New Age spirituality, there is a, um, Earth-centric spirituality, there's Christian spirituality and Muslim spirituality and Jewish spirituality, all these things that speak to us answering the deepest questions of our lives. Things such as, who am I and why am I here? So the question is, what are you doing about your spirituality? Because that directly relates to your character. Now, in, in my understanding of spirituality, religion is the thing, for most people, which contributes to spirituality. Religion is the means to the end of spirituality. Religion is the, are the rituals and the relationships and, and the community that you're involved in to help you become more spiritual, to help you as you wrestle with those questions. Who am I and why am I here? You say, well, I'm not, I don't believe in God. That's not what I said. For some people, religion uh, could be the things they do religiously to bolster their spirituality. For many of you, it's going to church and, or a synagogue um, uh, and you know, reading sacred scripture, being part of a, a study group, all those sorts of things. Those are great. Other people may say, well, I don't have religion. And I say, well, well, how do you bolster your spirituality? Well, they say, well, um, I, I, I have a bunch of Harley dudes that we get together on Saturday. We go to the Cracker Barrel, if that's where Harley people go, I'm not sure. Go, go to the Cracker Barrel, uh, and, uh, and, they, we, we, and as we ride through the mountains, I know that there's something bigger than me. I would say that for that individual, because they do that religiously to bolster their spirituality, for them, that accomplishes the same purpose. The question is, what do you do? And how will you take care of your character from this point going forward? That's the question. 
If you look at the popular literature on leadership and professionalism, I would argue that it pretty much all says the same thing, using different words, but it all points to personal character leading to professional competence, which then leads to organizational effectiveness. This comes from PACE. Now, we would expect them to say that, right? A popular book about professionalism, everything on that list can be put in one of those three categories. The 12 Elements of Great Managing, a study done by Gallup, 9 million managers and employees, 114 different countries, 41 different languages. Putting all that together, this is what you come up with. Everything on that list comes back to personal character, leading to professional competence, which then leads to organizational effectiveness. Another popular book, popular TED Talk. The things that matter and motivate people are those. Look especially at mastery and then purpose. What about this one? You've probably all seen this one. Good to great. You probably know that level five leadership in their study is humility. And the great surprise in the study was that um, a level five executive at the very top of the heap, the most effective organizational leaders are those who are humble. Why? Because they know that other people are more important than they are. And so how does the company go from good to great? They find disciplined people who are in a culture of disciplined thought and disciplined action. In other words, personal character leads to professional competence, which leads to organizational effectiveness. So who are you? What is your brand? What do people think about when they think about you? Now, these are some of my favorites. And the, the one thing you probably get from this is, what I would get from this is, this dude likes himself some coagulated sugar. <laughs> I mean, you know, Krispy Kreme, bring it on. Chick-fil-A, sandwich, fries, but I want the sweet tea. Smithfield barbecue, Hershey's chocolate, anybody but Duke. And my poor Redskins. As we Redskins fans always say, there's always next year. But others of you may look at this list and you might think, think different things about these brands. If you're a vegetarian, for instance, you might look at Chick-fil-A and Smithfield's Barbecue and say, first of all, what did that chicken ever do to you? That pig never had anything bad for you and you're going to go ahead and eat it. But see, people think things about you based on your personal character, your professional competence, and the contribution that you make to organizational effectiveness. What do you think that our client thinks about this brand? You know what we want them to think, right? Complete domination in air, space, and cyberspace. Boom. That's what we want. But some people may look at this and think, isn't that the bunch that had a bunch of missile officers cheating on a test? Isn't that the bunch that has a problem with sexual assault? Or was that the bunch that had a school that had a cheating scandal one time or a drug scandal? I read a pretty disturbing article uh, in, on 16th of February, 2016. And the title of the article is this. Why is America losing faith in its military? Well, that'll get you attention. 
It went on to say that for the first time in the 23 years that the Gallup poll has, this particular Gallup poll has been taken, for the first time in 23 years, um, the, the confidence that Americans have to this question, is the U.S. military the number one military in the world? For the first time, it went below 50% to 49%. Last year, it was 59%. Now, there might be reasons for some of that, right? It, it may be that it's an election year. So maybe that has something to do with it. But it also may be that there is a resurgent Russia and a, a rising China um, and, and uh, Iran and North Korea and counterterrorism and ISIL. And so the average American may wake up in the morning going, I wonder, can these guys do what needs to be done to keep me safe? I wonder, when there's a cheating scandal, or when an airman does something bad, it reflects upon the whole Air Force. They never ask, well, wait a minute, um, I know it's an airman, but do they work with bombs, or do they work in finance? They never ask that question. Because the public trust is based on all of us having personal character, which leads to professional competence and organizational effectiveness. That's why every decision you make is important. Here's some individuals who understood pretty doggone well personal character, professional competence, in organizational effectiveness. Every career field has, uh, has their heroes, right? These are the chaplains. In fact, these are known as the four chaplains. These four chaplains, two Protestants, a Catholic, and a rabbi. This is not a joke. <laughs> These four chaplains met at Harvard because back in the day, that's where the chaplain school was. They became really fast friends. Um, yes, they had differences of opinion about religion, but they had the same opinion about service before self and their soldiers. Well, uh, they were on a, a ship called the USAT Dorchester. Had been a cruise liner, outfitted for 300 people, but when the war came along, they retrofitted it to, to, to sleep 900 people. Pretty crowded boat. So all 900 got on this boat, and they were, uh, 902 to be exact, they were on this ship going across from Newfoundland to Greenland. The commander of the ship, the, the captain, got a little nervous based on some intel reports, and there, was, there were German U-boats in the area. So the, 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 the captain said, uh, you know, listen, guys, um, what I want you to do is uh, sleep fully clothed, and sleep with your life jackets on in case something happens. Well, you know, as any cadet would do, they did exactly what the captain ordered. No, they didn't. They said, he ain't never going to find out. I'm not going to sleep in no life jacket. That's not comfortable. Um, I'm not going to sleep in my clothes either, which is a good idea until a torpedo hits your ship which is what happened. Torpedo hits the ship broadside, and immediately all power goes out. So in the belly of the ship, it's pitch black dark. About 70 people died upon impact. Before they know it, the ship is going down. Pandemonium, chaos breaks out. Now these chaplains found themselves near the life jackets. They had slept in theirs. A, a, a soldier comes up to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, he tries to pass the rabbi going back down, back down to the hole of the ship. Rabbi says, well, where are you going? He says, it's cold out here. I'm going back to get my gloves. The rabbi said, that's okay. I have a second set of gloves. You take mine. Later, the soldier thought, that rabbi didn't have a second set of gloves. Nobody carries around a second set of gloves. Well, as the ship is going down, they're passing out life jackets. They pass out the very last life jacket, but there's still people standing in line to get them. These four chaplains, 
who were friends take off their life jackets and give it to these, the next four in line. Survivors, there were only about 200, said, as the ship was going down, these four chaplains, arm in arm, were singing and praying together. That's somebody who understands personal character, leads to professional competence, which leads to organizational effectiveness. This is Chaplain Robert Preston Taylor. He went to Baylor, which rhymes, Taylor from Baylor. He also went to Southwestern Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Chaplain Taylor um, joined the military and on, on, in May of 1941, catch the year, May of 1941, uh, he found himself in Manila, the Philippines, taking care of his soldiers. Well, a few months passes and December 7th, then December 8th in the Philippines happens. On December 9th, after the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, they invade the Philippines. And for the next four years, he goes on the Bataan Death March. He's a couple of times left for dead. Uh, he is uh, in a couple of different POW camps. Uh, he, he gives of himself so that his fellow soldiers can live. He's on a, uh, a ship which is going, a, a death ship basically going from the Philippines to Japan. And as luck would have it, that ship is attacked by American aircraft. Um, uh, so everybody on the ship jumps off, including Chaplain Taylor. Well, the problem was, among others, is that there are people on the shore shooting at the survivors. Somehow, Chaplain Taylor made it to shore. He then spent the next four years in multiple POW camps. What do you think a person thinks about for four years in a POW camp? Finally, the day, is come, the day comes, and he is uh, uh, rescued, and the war is over, and he goes back home and cannot wait to see his wife. He shows up in San Francisco. His wife meets him at the ship. She says, Robert, they told me you were dead, and I remarried. You think about that for a second. What did he do? He carried on. And eventually became the Air Force Chief of Chaplains. He understood personal character. Hard choices. Leads to professional competence. Which leads to organizational effectiveness. Chaplain on the right, Emil Capone. Medal of Honor, a very similar story to Chaplain Taylor. But he gave of himself in a POW camp so that others could live. And he died of malnutrition and starvation. Awarded the Medal of Honor because he understood personal character leads to professional competence, which leads to organizational effectiveness. Elizabeth Mann is a chaplain assistant, recently retired, but still works in the chaplain corps as a civilian. She was born with a cleft palate and a cleft lip. Was thrown away by her parents in India. All she remembers is that one day as she's living on the streets, one day a very nice lady shows up in a blue outfit trimmed with in, in white. She's put into an orphanage. She would later learn that that nice lady was Mother Teresa. Eventually, she was adopted by an army nurse, a U.S. army nurse who was stationed at Fort Carson. And so when Elizabeth Mann decided that she wanted something to do with her life, she said, how do I give back to this country who has given so much to me? So she put on that uniform. And she looked down at her uniform and she saw that on one side was her last name, on the other side was U.S. Air Force. Your uniform will look a whole lot like that. And the question is, which of these name tags is more important to you? Deng Poor, a chaplain assistant, currently serving. Have you heard of the Lost Boys of Sudan? Here's one. Imagine your village when you're five years old being overrun, killing everything in sight, your aunt taking you, putting, her on, putting you on her back and running for your life, never knowing if your mother made it out alive or not. 
And for the next number of years, you go from refugee camp to refugee camp, some of which are overrun, so you're on the run again. But somehow, sometime in the providence of God, he becomes one of the 4,000 who become one of these lost boys of Sudan who find their way to America. And so when he, he, at 16 years old, he gets here not speaking a single word of English. When he thinks about how can I repay this country, he, he, he puts on the uniform. And he notices, hey, there, there are two names on my shirt. There's this name on this side, which is not insignificant, but there's also this name on the other side that says U.S. Air Force. That's pretty important. Which of these is more important? Well, he, he picked the one on the left-hand side of his uniform, not the one on the right. Because he understood that personal character leads to professional competence, which leads to organizational effectiveness. I met these two last week at a, a panel featuring in the invisible wounds of war, traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Six different couples. Nate Nelson was a special ops intel guy who uh, in a combat situation found himself sleeping where special ops people sleep anywhere you can lay down your head. A 107 millimeter rocket hits where he's sleeping. He finds himself paralyzed immediately from the chest down. Of course, that was the least of his worries at the moment because they had to keep him alive. Well, over the course of many, many months, he, he did stay alive. So I met him last week on this Invisible Wounds of War panel. Oh, there he is. I want you to look at this picture. And what I want you to look at is look at, <clears throat> look at how his wife is looking at him. You see, she understands personal character pretty well herself. Because plenty of people in similar situations would not have their spouse sitting beside them to this day. So I went up to, uh, to Nate later. I said, dude, thank you for what you've done for this country. You know what he said to me? He said, Chaplain, I feel kind of guilty. I said, brother, what do you have to feel guilty about? He says, well, on this panel, this was about the invisible wounds of war, you know, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. He says, I, I don't have any of those. That, brothers and sisters, is character. He understood that the name on the right side of his shirt was less important than the name tag on his left. This is an Olympic year. And I get excited about the Olympics. In 1980, I was a 10th grader in high school. Do the math. I know you weren't born. Your parents may not have been born. So there I was, sitting on the couch, and I'd been following the Olympic hockey team. And the hope was that they would do a miracle. Well, this was a miracle that nobody knew was going to happen. Because in six of the previous seven Olympiads, the Russians had won the gold medal. And we had no professionals back in the day. Professional, I, used, I misused the word, I'm sorry. We had no hockey players who were paid to do, uh, play hockey. So we had a bunch of college kids, 20 of them showed up. And these college kids, as hockey players do, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty rough. They're, they're, they're pretty tough. And so Coach Herb Brooks was the one who was called to, to make the miracle happen. And Coach Herb Brooks comes along and he walks into a practice and he sees a couple of dudes wailing on each other. Now, these dudes are on the same team at this point. And so he says, hey, guys, break, break, break this up. It's not cool. Break this up. He says, tell you what, let's get to know each other. You gather around. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me three things. Tell me who you are, tell me where you're from, and tell me who you play for. First guy says, I'm Jim Craig from 
Northeastern Massachusetts. I play for the university, or I play for Boston University. The next guy said, I'm Mike Ramsey. I play, I, I'm from uh, um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I play for the University of Minnesota. The next guy said, I'm Mark Johnson. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, and I play for the University of Wisconsin. The last one in this example says, I'm Mike Aruzioni. I'm from Winthrop, Massachusetts, and I play for Boston University. Later in the movie, these guys were not gelling like they should, certainly not in a way to beat the Russians. And they had just tied the Norwegian team, which they should have beaten handily. As they skate off the court, or off the, off the rink, uh, uh, Herb Brooks says, uh, where do you think you're going? Well, the game's over, coach. We're, we're, we're going to the locker room. He says, no, you're not. You don't want to play during the game. You're going to play now. And so he took them back out on the ice, and they went back and forth, and back and forth. And he says, again, and they skate from one to the other, again, again. About half an hour later, the building custodian comes and says, uh, oh, 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 by the way, coach, you've got to be finished. He says, no, I don't. So he cuts the lights off and leaves the building. Again, again, back and forth and back and forth. He says, you guys think that... You have enough individual talent to beat the Russians. You don't, and you will never have enough individual talent to beat the Russians. Here's the one thing you got to know. you got to know that when you put that jersey on, the name on the front is way more important than the name on the back. Again, again. Again, and so finally, you see the, the players all kind of crouch down like this, uh, and, and the camera pans over to Mike Aruzioni. And Mike Aruzioni says, Mike Aruzioni, Winthrop, Massachusetts. And the coach says, who do you play for? He says, coach, I play for the United States of America. And the coach says, that's all, gentlemen, and walks off the ice. See, that's the question when it comes to personal character and professionalism and your professional competence and your organizational effectiveness. It, it comes to this question, who do you play for? Do you play for the name on the right side of your shirt or do you play for the name on the left? It's a question you've got to answer. And soon you'll get to answer it. Because you will take an oath. And that oath will say those words that indicate personal character. It leads to professional competence, which leads to organizational effectiveness. I think about three people who used to be in that crowd. A class of 84 guy who helped train me. And was the guy who came up to me and, during Hell Week and said to me, you can make it when I didn't believe I could. In October of 96, he was killed in an F-16 crash, and so I think about him. I think about my training NCO, Mark McCarthy, whose dad, you probably may recognize, General McCarthy, he's here as a civilian these days, or a retired general officer, he's around here all the time. His son was my training NCO. He was the guy that, you know, I love to hate. But I discovered later that he was training me to be a professional. He died in an F-16 crash in January of 1995. So I think about him. I think about one of my own classmates who was in the same major as mine, operations research, a guy named Jeff Olson, who was killed in a B-52 crash in February of 1991 after a bombing run in Desert Storm. That's who I think about. I think about Staff Sergeant Scott Sather, who was killed the first airman killed in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Because I think about him because I was the chaplain on call that night, and at about 1 in the morning, they said, Chaplain, we have a death notification. We need you to come in. And I came in to learn about Scott Sather and what he had done. Those guys understand personal character leads to professional competence, which leads to organizational effectiveness. The stakes are really, really high, so high, that we have to be really good at what we do. This is what my boss says about this topic. The stakes are so high 
that the standards have to be higher. And if they aren't, maybe you should find another line of work. That's what my boss says about it. Or, in the words of Chuck Norris, go pro or go home. All right, what questions do you have? About anything. Yes, ma'am. Yes. It does. I think the word itself in many ways explains the concept. The, the word integrity, same, same word, root word that we would get the word integer. So the difference in an integer, a whole number, and a fraction. And so integrity means I live according to uh, my conscience, my, the, the, the standards. In other words, I do what is right, period. I do what is right not just when people are watching, I do what is right, because sometimes, as a friend of mine who's sitting in the audience today reminded me just yesterday, sometimes um, doing what's right when people are watching is hard. It, it's having moral courage. It's doing the right thing regardless. Right, right. The way you it, just it is. That's right. That's right. That, that, that is why um, when we go back to character, you know, character being an integrity is part of your character. And so it, it is about uh, how you train your conscience. And so we could get into a conversation, a large and long conversation, about which worldview or which worldviews um, are appropriate, for instance. All right? So, so um, the, the, the fact that a person lives according to I will say, let's talk about the Air Force. There is an acceptable, uh, there, there are acceptable bounds of behavior that are based on these concepts of professionalism and integrity and service and excellence. Um, and so from those come things like loyalty and commitment. Other things sort of emanate from those, from those uh, um, kind of root words there. Uh, Integrity can't be. I, 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 would, I would completely agree. Yeah, I, I would not disagree with that at all. Yeah, but it goes back to who, who then defines what those boundaries are. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, that's the issue. And so in the Air Force as a profession, as an institution, you know, leadership has to sort of help figure out what those bounds are. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, 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 the boundaries and the directions that society would have us go um, may not be the best thing for the institution, and the institution exists for the benefit of society, as we've, as we've discussed. Yeah, so that ultimately is the challenge of leadership. Good question, thank you, yes. One second, um, would you mind speaking in the microphone for the sake of the recording, just so everyone can hear yeah. the uh, question. I'll come to you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm C1C Olson from Cadet Squadron 20. Um, I'm a senior about to graduate and commission, and one of my main concerns as an officer is to be able to take care of my people effectively. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but it's a common misconception that um, atheists, freethinkers, and humanists cannot be spiritual in some way. Um, and I think we would all agree that um, given uh, the existential and moral questions that arise from the nature of our profession, that some spiritual guidance is needed to deal with those things. So how does the Chaplain Corps um, look to change in the future to accommodate these people to make sure that they're taken care of and their spiritual needs? Yeah, again, that's a great question. The, 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 the Chaplain Corps exists 
to take care of everyone's spiritual needs. And so the way we do this, um, it happens all the time, and I can't tell you the number of times as a chaplain, someone has come into me, and the first thing they say before they sit down is, chaplain, I'm not very religious. And most often, they just want to make sure that that's okay with me. And guess what? It's, it's okay with me. Because my job is to help them um, wrestle with those issues of who I am, what my purpose is, those sorts of things. And if they're atheist or agnostic or humanist, that, that impacts me not at all. Because our conversation is about what is important to you. And there are some cases where, let's say somebody came in and our worldviews were so different. Or they wanted me to help them in a way that I just couldn't help them. Uh, we get to a thing that we in the chaplain corps call, we either provide or provide for. And so if I can't help you, I will refer you to somebody who can. Uh, but, but so th that's the issue. Whether or not a person is, they would say they're spiritual, spiritual or not, I would just push back a little bit with them. And I think even for an atheist, for instance, I think we would get to a point where they would say, okay, yes, I do think there's something bigger than myself. And that's what I would say for them is, is the, the, the essence of what I would call spirituality, even if they wouldn't. Yeah. And Chaplain Costin, we have time for one more question. Okay. And I'll stay down here as long as you want. So I'll be down here until the, the day is done. Uh, Chaplain, thank you for uh, coming and speaking with us this afternoon. Um, I'm C1C Lucas Villa. Um, I will also be graduating soon. And um, you talk about how um, personal character is so monumental to professionalism and you know getting things done, uh, things that matter. Uh, could you speak to how spirituality impacts our, per, uh, our personal character? Sure. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a uh, person of faith myself, but I would also point, point to the, the four pillars of comprehensive airman fitness. So it's physical, it's mental, it's social, and it's spiritual. And so if we start with spiritual, spiritual is those, you know, who am I, why am I here, what's my purpose in life, what's bigger than myself? Okay, so that, that's one. Um, physical is, is the things that you know about. What about mental and social? How do they fit in? So um, when we think about comprehensive airman fitness, the most important word in that is comprehensive. And so this is a holistic thing that we're doing. Um, we don't live our lives only as physical beings or only as mental persons or only as social beings. This is all encompassing. And so for me, and I think uh, the literature would, would back this up, is that spirituality um, is, is, you know, the thing that we, the, the end game. How do I wrestle with these really tough issues? Religion is, as I mentioned earlier, religion is that thing, that the, the, the means to that end. All right, so in religion, we talk about rules and relationships and uh, rituals, those kind of things that point me to something that's bigger than myself. Well, what religion will also do in most every case, um, e even, even, uh, even non-religious groups, all right, um, there are other benefits to religion. You get together and you talk about those important things. Well, that sort of deals with both the mental and the social aspects of comprehensive airman fitness. And so when we think about what makes a whole person, um, a whole, we were designed to, to live and grow in community, right? Uh, and so if you're part of a religious or a faith group or, or even uh, um, uh, a humanist group, let's say, all right, which gets together and does the same kinds of things, the benefits uh, in terms of spirituality, I would say are the same. And so we, you, if you hang around people who are like-minded and who push you in these areas, um, you're, you grow mentally, you grow socially, and you grow spiritually. So that's kind of how it works. And so the, the first thing, if somebody comes into me and says, uh, and says you know, I'm, I'm lonely or I'm this or I'm that, uh, I, would, I, would, I just ask them to talk to me about their disciplines. What do you do personally to make sure that your spiritual life is growing? Um, and if they don't have ideas, then I can help them think through some of those things. But most often, I will say, what group do you hang around most when you're not at work? So it, it's, it's multifaceted. Sure. Chaplain Costin, thank you so yeah. much for your, for your message. Thank you.